Goodness gracious me, I'm having to do this again. It happens. It happens. Every now and again, I seem to get a comment almost every year about the Graf Zeppelin. And it's usually someone going, but it had this. It was going to have this. And so I've decided I'm going to do another video, which is specifically entirely about the Graf Zeppelin. So in future, instead of me having to point to a section within a video, I can just point to this video and go, this is my blanket answer. So, first off, before anyone gets into it, Casemated 6-inch guns on an aircraft carrier have no justification in terms of, well, you know, if the carrier was fighting another carrier. Someone the other day commented on the fact that if it was in bad enough weather, she could sneak up with six inch gu her six-inch guns and sink you on an armoured carrier. For starters, I know what happened to Glorious. was travelling with only two destroyers of escort. And yes, the Royal Navy were really annoyed at le several levels of command that that got let happen because the decision to stop carriers carrying with just a couple of destroyers as escort had been taken a long time ago. They were supposed to have cruisers. Or in courageous case, she was sunk, but she was surrounded by most of a flotilla of destroyers at the time. So yes, I pre would prefer not to have her doing anti-submarine warfare and doing that because she's a fleet carrier and she's freaking useful for that role. But she did have a lot more than two destroyers with her at the time. And she did have aircraft up as well. Which, of course, Glorious didn't. But Glorious is an issue. Leaving that to one side, if you were in bad enough weather that the Royal Navy cannot launch its aircraft, and remember, we're talking about the only all-weather fleet air arm in service in 1939, 40, 41, 42. The US are sort of getting there in 43, but they have specific night fighter squadrons, whereas the Royal Navy are still training all their fleet air arm for the entirety of them to operate at night, which is considered a weather circumstance in flying, as well as in bad weather, and taking off and landing in bad weather, and using the systems which they developed for night flying to assist with the taking off and landing in bad weather. If it is a sea state, which is bad enough that the Royal Navy is not able to launch and recover its aircraft. Bad enough they won't launch and recover their aircraft. You're in a sea state which is bad enough that your case made of six inch guns aren't going to work. But I can tell you what will work. The guns on the escorting cruisers and destroyers around the armoured carrier. And even more fun, if you're getting that close, there'll probably be a capital ship there as well to go, Hello! So please, stop doing these comments. Because all I'm sitting there thinking is, well, you've decided World of Warships, instead of being an exceptionally fun game to play and a really entry a good entrance tool into history, is actual real life. And actually in real life, carriers do hang around on that one-on-one -on -one and end up fighting each other one-on-one -on -one in a duel. When in reality, no. And in reality, you wouldn't have a map limited, and the carrier would be going nowhere as close as it is on that map. Nowhere near as close. I think that's probably the reason why they don't have aircraft carriers in Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts yet. Because, honestly, the sheer expanse that would suddenly have to be covered the moment you had an aircraft carrier. It's bad enough with surface ships running around without an aircraft carrier. So now I've dealt with all the random stuff which comes up. Let's look at the actual Graf Zeppelin design. And let's start off with... Shameless book plug. Yes, I've got a book on Destroyers out. It's very nice it's coming out in the second edition soon. And I've got four other books on the way. And eventually I do plan on turning my PhD thesis into a book. Which will of course be about aircraft carriers. Although that will be about the Royal Navy's aircraft carriers. And then I'll use my notes from my PhD to do books about aircraft carriers of the US Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy and their formation of their naval aviation. 
And then my long-term plan is to do naval aviation in other navies, because I've studied law fairly extensively, and including I would do the French, the German, and the Italian. I would do it on the navies which didn't have a large naval aviation going into World War II for whatever reasons, and how it was de and how, what they were looking at. Because I could sort of that would make about four evenly sized books in my mind. And the thing is. The Graf Zeppelin is actually launched. There is an actual hull in the water. Okay? So, there is that much effort put into it. However, let's start off with, why am I linking it into, the, the, uh, when I'm talking about that book, into discussions of the French and the Italians? Because all three nations pick the French-style system for carrier management. Now, here is a thing, just a small point, but it might not be the really tip-top system if the Royal Navy, the who has the most aircraft carriers in the interwar years, the US Navy, and the Imperial Japanese Navy, the three navies which in invest the absolute most in naval aviation, all look at your system and all make variations that are remarkable on lines of it's engineeringly perfect, oh my lord, how does it work in a seaway? If all three of them look at your system and universally go, oh no. There might be a, I don't know, a smidgen of a point in there you want to consider. So it's not just me who considers the system to be bad. There are actual contemporary accounts at the time who explain that this system, whilst sounding so engineeringly amazing, is a, I think one of them puts it like that, I do love this turn of phrase, Unfortunately, this system is not yet of our current technological time frame. It might have prospects for the future, but there will be have to be significant maturation of technology before it becomes practicable in the heavy seas and global waters in which we operate. So, for the Mediterranean, fine. Maybe you can get away with it. Maybe it's a sensible system for Mediterranean. I'm not going to debate that. That you can use an excuse for the burn and for the Italian Navy. The Royal Navy didn't think so, but there again, the Royal Navy had to operate their carriers everywhere in the world, so the Royal Navy don't count in that scenario because, you know, the others are thinking more about the Mediterranean than the Royal Navy is. But this is for the... German Navy. This is for the Kriegsmarine. This is for operating in the North Sea and North Atlantic. You have got a system which is Considered to be prone to damage by inclemental weather, exposed to salt water, and requiring perfection of the crew under all circumstances in order to make sure everything is matted up properly. Oh my, I can't think what could go wrong. So let's read the description of the system. So, the system for aircraft management. Let's start off with, well, the lifts. They're octuple in shape. Now, that can sound like a good thing or a bad thing, depending on who you're, who you're talking about. They're an octagonal shape. It, 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 Octu I said it's octuple, didn't I? Sorry, I was reading two sets of notes at the same time and I read the wrong octo. And it's just, octagonal can sound like a good thing. 
It can sound like you're sort of going, well, it's got more space. But then you think about an aircraft. You think about its shape. And you also think about the shaping of the deck and systems on a ship and how the framing is probably going to be square. You start to think about how this can impact things like survivability if it's hit by anything. And, you know, this, this flight deck was a steel flight deck. They were also putting in, uh, talking about putting in armor and various other things to try and protect it. There, there were ideas. There were ideas. But that's just part of it. And the ha the uh, the lifts were uh, the elevators were um, electrically operated, and they were designed to transfer aircraft weighing up to five and a half tons between the decks. So, there was a limit, but let's be honest, that's quite a hefty limit. Um, it wouldn't have taken some of the later war aircraft fully loaded, but you could load them up on deck, I suppose. But that's not the really fun thing. So, they're using compressed air-driven telescoping catapults. Mm, not the same thing as accelerators used on the Royal Navy and US Navy carriers, but they're, they're, they're sort of on the same principle. Uh, that were designed to accelerate a two and a half ton fighter to a speed of approximately 140 kilometers an hour and a five ton bomber to about 130 kilometers an hour. Okay. However, how did the aircraft get to these elevators, to these catapults? Well, it all starts with rails. The very railway logistically minded Germany was going for a railway orientated aircraft carrier. And the British put it as um, it might not be suitable for operating in rough waters and rough seas. The US Navy, who considered the same system for the Essex class carriers, rejected it as too time consuming because a dual set of rails led back from the catapults to the forward and midship elevators only, not to the aft elevator, because they're spread out, three of them. In the hangars, the aircraft were hoisted by crane onto collapsible launch trolleys. The aircraft trolley combination is then what is lifted to the flight deck level on the elevator, trundled along the rails, I do love the number of sources which use the phrase trundled. I'm not sure which book or a journal article first used it, but I have seen trundled on like five different articles about it, so I'm not sure who came up with that phraseology, but it sounds lovely, so I'm sticking with it. To the start points, the catapult start points. When the catapults were triggered... The compressed air propelled the slideways within the tra catapult tracks forward. So as each plane lifted off, its trolley would reach the end of the slideway, but remain locked in place until the tow attachment cables were released. And once the slideways were attracted back into the catapult track wells, and the tow cables unhooked, the launch trolleys would be manually pushed forward onto recovery platforms, lower to the forecast on B deck, and then rolled into, uh, into the upper hangar for reuse via a secondary set of rails. When not in use, the capital tracks were to be covered with sheet metal fairings to protect them from the harsh weather. Okay. <laughs> All right. So think about this. You're trying to do rapid launch, and you've got to start moving these things out of the way. And I know, in theory, they get out the way themselves. But let's be honest, there is the reality of life. And, oh my, just think of the fun. But it gets better. It gets better. 18 aircraft could have theoretically been launched at a rate of one every 30 seconds before exhausting the air reservoirs of the catapult. It would then have taken 50 minutes to recharge the reservoirs. Now, this is for a ship with a designed air group of 43. So, they have 10 fighters 
13 Junkers Ju87 C dive bombers and 20 uh, Faisler F167 biplane torpedo bombers planned in 1939. By 1942, it's 15 Messerschmitt Me 115 fighters and 28 Junkers Ju87 E dive torpedo bombers slash torpedo bombers. Now, I am impressed by that development and the standardization of aircraft. I, uh, that is something which I do appreciate, as you know, I am the, always forever singing the praises of focusing down aircraft. I, I do think carrier air group should consist of, as a rule, a fighter air defense aircraft and a strike aircraft, and probably these days an airborne early warning aircraft and an anti-submarine warfare aircraft, but and some sort of aircraft which probably supplies them all with fuel at certain points. But leaving that to one side, and also these, these days probably an uncrewed wingman as well, but leaving that to one side, it is very nice to see the Germans paring down a system. But it's also me thinking that, let's say you've just launched a strike, an enemy air attack's come in, your caps had to return back to the ship because the, fir the first wave came in, they fought them off, and now you've got 50 minutes before you can launch any more cap. Or do you not launch a strike of 18? Do you launch a strike of 16 or 14? So that you don't go all the way down, so you have enough there to launch a cap. Think about it. From the outset, it is always planned that all of the Graf Zeppelin's aircraft would launch normally via the catapult. Rolling takeoffs would only be performed in an emergency. And realistically, none of the designs they really work for it are really suitable for a rolling takeoff. They can, but they're taking off in an incredibly lightened manner, i.e. not full fuel not full ammunition. So even if you're launching your cap in a rolling capacity, that's going to be fun. Uh, you know, there are issues with this. Uh, I would also add that the, um, the cylinders holding the compressed air were housed in insulated compartments located between the two catapult tracks. Okay. That is below flight deck level, but above the main armoured deck, because the armoured deck was going to be below the hangar level. So think about that in terms of battle damage and Murphy's, Sods, whatever variation of the bad luck law you want to go with, all are options. The compartments were also electrically heated to a temperature of about 20 degrees centigrade, in order to prevent ice from forming on the cylinder piping and the control equipment as the compressed air was vented during launches. Now, think about that again in terms of operating, I don't know, in the Arctic Circle. Yes, you, you can in theory do that, but if anything goes wrong with that electrics and, oh, electrics in a saltwater cold environment, they never go wrong. Ah. <sighs> Now, please note, I am not saying, and someone will ultimately probably comment on this, I'm not saying that the designs picked by the Royal Navy and the US Navy and the IJN and all the other, those navies were absolutely perfect in all environments. I'm not saying that they didn't have problems. I'm just saying that the Germans have gone with the most engineeringly amazing idea and, you know, have designed it to be engineeringly perfect because it offers precision of takeoff and all these sort of wonderful things and haven't thought through the fact that you're going to be operating this in the most hostile environment known to mankind. And whilst, yes, there are still going to be plus and minuses of a more, I hate to say simpler, but a, um, a more rugged system. It might have other fors and against, but the thing is you can keep it working more in a more uh, straightforward fashion. 
I do realise these videos are supposed to be 20 minutes. This is not going to be 20 minutes. It's just not. And please note, it's not me doing a hatchet job on the Graf Zeppelin, because I've done that already a few times when I've been asked by people what's wrong with it. This is me trying to go through the Graf Zeppelin, and I'll, I'll talk to you about its rationale and their, you know, why the German Navy became so over-engineering. But first of all, I'm going to go through the reasons why it is not this supercarrier which some commentators love to believe. Now, they also planned a system that, well, let's put it this way, uh, the idea was this system meant that the Grau Zeppelin could launch their aircraft without needing for the ship to turn into wind or under conditions where the prevailing winds were too light to provide enough lift for heavier aircraft. Also, it allowed them to theoretically launch and, re launch and recover aircraft simultaneously. Although, one of the things I would note is that the... Uh, how do I put this? Uh, there isn't seem to be enough of an emphasis on barriers and arrestor gear for my liking. They do have them, but it's again it's it's it, it's the system which is designed for everything to be working perfectly as it will certainly be working perfectly because we are going to maintain it perfectly because in combat all these systems work perfectly and i haven't even gone to the engines yet which as we all know they have the same high pressure engines as their capital ships have which again do not always work perfectly and often require so much special coddling that frankly they drive their chief engineers nutty I'm going to go back to this one before I get onto stats they were also worried about rapid catapult launches and eliminating the city of time consuming engine warm ups on their aircraft because this was a real problem so they designed a system where up to 8 aircraft were to be kept in readiness aboard the carriers and because Zeppelin was going to be one of two on a hangar deck by using steam preheaters. These systems would keep the aircraft engines at an operational temperature of 70 degrees centigrade. In addition, engine oil was to be kept warmed in separate holding tanks, then added via hand pumps to the aircraft engines shortly before launch. I can't see anything that can go wrong with this system on a ship on a surface which is doing that. Right at the top of the ship, where it's most exaggerated. While you're trying to do it in a hurry to get alert fighters up. I can understand the idea of the system. It sounds a great idea. I'm, it's just the reality is what disturbs me most. It's like... Whenever I look at the Draft Zeppelin, I see a wonderful amount of engineering thought and deep logic has gone into it. But at no point has someone gone, yes, but have you thought about how practical this is? I, don't, I know it's a wonderful system on paper and it's an absolutely amazing system. But have you actually tried to operate something like it on a vessel at sea? under those conditions because if you haven't perhaps we don't perhaps we save our money and put our time and effort elsewhere because just think of the amount of engineering time and research time was put into this ship for nothing to be produced and once the aircraft were raised to flight deck level via the elevators, um, the aircraft oil temperature could be maintained, if need be, through the use of electric preheaters plugged into power points on the flight deck. Otherwise, the aircraft could have been immediately catapult launched as their engines would already have been at or near operation, normal operating temperatures. Now, you can sit there and go, well, Alex, this is a brilliant operation for ice 
and for operating in cold weather, and I would have to agree with you. It's a brilliant on paper. But then let's think about that in reality if you're operating in a cold area where it's cold enough this is going to have an impact. Electrical points on the deck which are going to be roughly handled to keeping the engines warm. This all happening to aircraft which, by the way, are sitting on trolleys which collapse. And various other fixed systems. Now what I love about this particular drawing here is it doesn't show the octagonal doesn't show the octagonal lifts. In fact I think it only shows two lifts. Because this is the only drawing of it. And the Office of Naval Intelligence they do like to put their own spin on things. It's like they don't believe certain things certain things about torpedoes etc. But anyway, you can sort of make out the octagonal shape of lifts on this picture. So, she displaces 33,500 ton, long tons. That's 34,000 tons fully loaded. And... For comparison, okay, because the Graf Zeppelin, she is laid down in 1936, launched in December 1938. So I have to pick an equivalent carrier to focus her on. And I'm not going to pick an American strike carrier because the Americans have the advantage they're building massive carriers, but and they're, they're focusing on fighting in the Pacific. So it's unfair. Let's look at another cold weather contemporary carrier built at a similar time. Oh! I could go for HMS Ark Royal, but I will go for HMS Illustrious. I will be nice. Launched in 1939. Okay, so the uh, Graf Zeppelin launched in December 1938. Illustrious launched in 1939. Of course, she was launched in April 1939, commissioned in May 1940. Graf Zeppelin was launched in December 1938 and never commissioned. Again, please note, this is the British long-term plan of the Treaty of Versailles. They used it to cripple Amer uh, German maritime industry, so Germany couldn't build a lot of ships. It's my main problem with Plan Z and all these things that they have for building up their fleets is, okay, so you need to have hand wavy and magic, or you need to spend your entire time investing in building maritime infrastructure instead of putting the same amount of money into the army. This ain't going to happen in a German scenario. So, ultimately, there are issues with all their plans. But she displaced 33,500 tons, or 34,088 tons, Fully loaded. So, okay, illustrious. They displaced 23,000 tons in standard. And roughly 28,000 tons. It changes as time goes on through. World War Two to full load because of course their standard way standard displacement is twenty three thousand tons. It's even more than HMS Ark Royal by the way, which standard displacement of twenty two thousand tons. And yes, I am using this and the Indefatigables, which are also roughly twenty eight thousand tons. It's rather interesting reading this book and going, okay, how heavy is this carrier? How heavy is it really? And when you consider Ark Royal. 22,000 tons standard, 27,700 tons deep, which I'm considering equivalent to full load for the problem, for the purposes of this video. Or as close to as we can get. Uh, indefatigable, 23,460 tons standard, 28,970 tons deep. And Indefatigable, remember, carried 72 aircraft. So did Ark Royal. 
Something starts to wonder about this ship. You start to think, hang on, what's going on here? You know, what is happening? This ship is massively heavy, and yet the same problems seem to be turning up as turn up with the rest of German ship design. It's incredibly inefficient for its tonnage. Okay, so it's 262 meters in length. Well, again, let's do this comparison with Illustrious because... Honestly, that's the nicest comparison I can make. Once I start putting in other ships, we get into a small problem. Illustrious is 225.6 meters overall length. 216.4 meters at the waterline. 262 overall. Well, that puts her in the category of comparing with, well... I suppose, broadly speaking, she's actually longer than Ark Royal. Actually longer than Ark Royal. So she's a big, big carrier. Okay. Beam, 36.2 meters. That's, again, fatter than the other ships. And draft. Eight and a half meters. Well, that's slightly shallower. Illustrious is 8.8 .8 meters, but let's be honest. If you're only saving 30 centimeters of draft, that's not really a lot. 16 oil-fired, ultra-high pressure, Le Mans. So style supply uh, boilers supplied four geared turbines to drive four shafts of 200,000 shaft horsepower for a top speed of 33.8 knots or a range of 8,000 nautical miles at 19 knots. Well, that is faster. The top speed of Illustrious is 30 knots, but she's got three shafts and three geared turbines, and she's doing it all on the 111 shaft horsepower supplied by six Admiralty free drum boilers, which generate 83,000 kilowatts. So... You've got 16 boilers instead of six... You've got four turbines and four shafts and 200,000 shaft horsepower and you are generating three extra knots at top speed. Okay, so it's going to be in a range. Well, again, Illustrious is 10,700 nautical miles at 10 knots. So yeah, definitely cruising range is a win. If it had worked as planned, and if all those engines, boilers, etc. had worked as planned. Complement, 1,720. Illustrious was 1,300. So there's an extra 420 people aboard. Sixteen six-inch guns, fifteen centimeters, are mounted, as has been noted, in casemates. Okay. And then 12 105 millimeter, 10.5 centimeter guns, 22 3.7 centimeter guns, or 37 millimeters, and 28 2 centimeter flat guns. Okay, so she's got a good air defense armament. Um, 100 millimeter armored belt. That's 3.9 inches. Well, the armored belt on the illustrious class is four and a half inches, uh, 114 millimeters. So it's about the same. Flight deck 45 millimeters. That's 1.8 inches. Flight deck on the armored carriers on illustrious is three inches or 76 millimeters. Main deck has a 60 millimeter armor, and the hangar sides and ends on the illustrious class are four and a half inches. 114 millimeters of armor. Okay. Original proposed confident was 42 aircraft, as said. Um, on the illustrious class, their original aircraft complement, when orientated around 
North Atlantic and initial World War II scenarios was usually 36. But that did expand up to 54 with adaptations during the war and at various points she's operating quite a few more. Uh, it's, it's when you add in sort of deck parking and various other scenarios that carry on and do ch and do change it for the operational. So, yeah, they 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 carry six more aircraft. Let's let's be nice and say six more aircraft as designed. So you're getting six more aircraft, and theoretically eight thousand nautical miles at nineteen knots for an extra. 6,000 tons fully loaded? And let's consider that armament, okay? The, the armament on the Graf Zeppelin, because... They have an interesting plan with the armament, and I, I, I know I'm working slowly down the ship. I've gone off the aircraft, and... Now I'm talking about the armament. Well, as is traditional with the Germans, never fit a dual-purpose gun if you can fit multiple separate guns. So you have both high and low-angle guns for anti-aircraft and anti-ship defense. Um, dual-purpose guns just weren't really in the German vernacular for some reason, and this adds in a lot of stuff to the weight. This is really a lot of stuff to the weight. And I'm going to turn off the top light. I, I turned it on to hunt books a second ago. I wanted to make sure I got things exactly right. Or at least as right as I could with a very, very accurate, with a, a very accurate book behind me. The 5.9 inch or 15 centimeter SKC-28 guns were paired in eight armored casemates. They mounted two each at the four corners of the carrier's upper hangar deck. Um, these positions are specifically noted that they were going to be washed out in heavy seas, especially those in the forward casemates. Originally, Chief Engineer Hedler, in charge of the project, had planned for only eight such weapons on the carriers, four on each side and in single mountings. But the Naval Armaments Office mis misinterpreted his proposal to save space by pairing them and instead doubled the number of guns to 16, uh, resulting in a need for increased ammunition stowage and more electrically operated hoists to service them. This is the big problem with the Graf Zeppelin. It's not that they don't have necessarily good ideas, and one or two of these might have been on their own, have made them an, ex an exceptionally interesting ship. It's the fact that there are so many, so many cooks adding their own ingredients to the broth and no one can say no. It just makes it for a mess. And ruins what could have been a good ship and makes it terrible. And then there are people who go up to go, but, 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 and it's no. I understand where you're coming from. There is a, a long history of it, it. you are only great as great as the enemy you are fighting, and therefore, if the enemy you're fighting is not producing a, a ter efficient a vessels and efficient systems, you must be terrible because you're beating someone who, or they are actually, especially when they actually win, because they're winning despite having the systems. But the truth is. The German large ship systems peaked with Scharnhorst and Eisenau. I mean, they literally peaked. They were better than the Deutschlands, and then it went downhill from there. And I mean, it went downhill hard. Scharnhorst and Eisenau, great designs. They're not amazing world setting on fire designs but they are very good for their job and if they kept iterating on them they'd have probably had a fairly decent fleet and if someone had gone let's build a simple straightforward carrier and then tried to the fancy weird stuff they'd have probably had a fairly decent carrier as well and so as but the nazi germany doesn't work like that the graf zeppelin is not produced in that scenario During her construction, they actually did consider deleting those guns. 
actually did consider it. And replacing them with 10.5, um, that's 4.1 inch guns, mounted on sponsons just below flight deck level. But the structural modifications needed for this were, uh, yeah, they were beyond, beyond sane. So it was shelved. The primary AA protection came from 12 of the 4.1 inch guns, uh, that's the 10.5 uh, 10 centimeter guns, paired in six turrets positioned free fore and free aft of the Carrier's Island, which you can see in this lovely model. Um, potential blast damage to planes sighted on the flight deck uh, when these guns fired support was considered an unavoidable risk. And it would have also meant that during air attack when the guns started firing, you can't launch aircraft. Or you can't launch aircraft and cover against enemy air attack from, I don't know, the port side. <sighs> the secondary air defences consisted, of course, the 11 twin 37mm. Um, or 3.7 centimeter guns mounted on sponsons located uh, along the flight deck edges. Four on the sub side, six to port, and one mounted on the ship's forecastle. I often think the six to port are meant to sort of compensate to an extent for the fact that the overwhelming heavy AA is over one side of the ship. And in addition, the seven or 20 millimeter guns, or that's two centimeter guns, were installed on single mount platforms on either side of the carrier. Four to port, three to starboard. And um, these guns were later changed to the uh, flak veerling mountings. Now, why are they building this ship? Why are the Germans building an aircraft carrier in the first place? Why are they building it and why are they using those engines? Because, let's be honest, Le Mans high-pressure boilers, they are the same ones as used in, well, similar to the ones used in the Admiral Hipper class heavy cruisers. And it is variations on it. The fact they also were going to use um, uh, Voff Schneider cylindrical, uh, cylindrical propeller rudders were to be installed in the forward bow of the ship along the center line in order to assist in berthing the ship in harbor and also negotiating narrow waterways such as the Kiel Canal, where it was felt due to the carrier's high freeboard and difficulty in maneuvering at speeds below 8 knots. They, remember, they knew this when they were designing it. They knew it was going to have difficulty manoeuvring at speeds below 8 knots, i.e. getting through the Kiel Canal, when they were designing it. They felt gusting winds might push the ship into the canal sides, so in emergency the units could have been used to steer the ships of speeds up to 12 knots, and also could be used to stop the ship hitting the side of the canal in high winds. If the ship's were main engines, were, well, they could steer the ships at speeds under 12 knots, and if the ship's main engines were rendered inoperable, could propel the vessel at a speed of 4 knots in calm seas. When not in use, they were to be retracted into their vertical shafts and protected by watertight covers. Now, again, I have talked about pop propulsion on modern ships regularly as a good idea. But again... In the 1940s, when these systems were being built, they are fairly fragile. They're not as robust as they are today, and certainly they're not going to be put in as much quantity as you would need today, so these things could get damaged quite easily. A straight stem bow was rebuilt in early 1940 with the addition of a more sharply angled Atlantic prow. This was intended to improve her overall seascaping, and this added another 5.2 meters to her overall length. So originally, she'd been designed with the uh, straight stem prow. She had some anti-torpedo protection, including bulges which the bulges were originally added because of, in May 1942, it was felt that the accumulating top weight of recent design changes meant that if you didn't add bulges, 
the vessel would go over. They served to provide anti-torpedo protection and stability, and added approximately 1,500 additional tons of fuel, so increasing her range. But I'm fairly certain the idea that they would have no effect on her top speed is not really correct. In fact, I'm fairly certain it's not correct. And there is actually another great picture I'm going to show, which I didn't add to the slides. Because I wanted it to just sit here. Because this is what she was looking at, uh, looking like in June 1940. After, to an extent, her bowels been rebuilt, but not after the, uh, not before the bulges have been added. Uh, you, you can see the casemate guns are still there. They will be removed to defend occupied Norway at some point, but, you know, they're there at that point. And you can really get an idea of what the ship is looking like. Now, why is Germany building an aircraft carrier? What is their reason for building an aircraft carrier? Are they building one just because the Anglo-German naval agreement allowed Germany to construct carriers with a total displacement up to 38,500 tonnes? in total of 38,500 tons standard displacement and it's the cumulative for their carriers. So they decided to displace, uh, to go for something which was roughly, well, they're supposed to use 38,500 tons. So theoretically you could go, well, yeah, that's going to be roughly 19 and a quarter thousand tons standard displacement. The design starts off being roughly 19 and a half thousand tons of stand displacement so they're already 250 tons over and this is scaled down from the 22,000 ton ship which Hadler had first designed that could carry 50 aircraft and had uh, Wilhelm Hadler as already mentioned is the uh, assistant prof to the professor of naval construction at the Technical University of Berlin for nine years and was appointed in charge of the carrier project in April 1934 well his original design was 22,000 standard tons, could carry 50 aircraft and steam at 35 knots. So, their first redraft of that, when they are standing up their, uh, their certain design, takes off 2,500 tons and presumably 8 aircraft. Then you read that the criteria the design staff decide, uh, agreed upon meant that the uh, aircraft carrier would need to be able to defend itself against surface combatants with the armour protection to the standard of a heavy cruiser. They sent in 1935, a Luftwaffe officer, a naval officer, and a constructor to visit Japan in the autumn of 1935 to obtain flight deck equipment, blueprints, and inspect the Japanese aircraft carrier Akagi. They also tried unsuccessfully to examine uh, HMS Furious. And yet still, they go with the French system. The system based on what France has produced. Their own German inspired system, but still a system based on what France produced. So, why are they building this? Why are they building a ship which is supposed to be able to combat a heavy cruiser? Which, by the way, in a ni in nicest way, six inch guns, case made of guns, not going to help you versus a heavy cruiser. Nah, not even going to help you against a 6-inch light cruiser, to be honest. If you come up against a town class, that's going to mincemeat you. If you try and challenge town class to surface engagement, there ain't going to be much of you left. Because its broadside is 12 guns with directional fire control, uh, with uh, central directory fire control in turrets. And you've got 8 in casemates that may occasionally work together as long as everything's working fine. 
This isn't good. So. Why? It all comes down to Germany's idea of how to win a war. I would love to say versus the French. And really that's where most of their ideas start from. Because they spend most of the 1920s thinking about fighting the French. Because they're about the only navy that they are close enough to that they think they could end up having to fight. And the French are very antagonistic towards the Germans. And the Germans are very upset with the French. And then from that, suddenly grows this idea that they could end up fighting the Royal Navy. Because Hitler comes to power and... Someone starts talking about a thousand-year Reich and the new German Empire and the Great Germany and all these things, and suddenly Britain's this obstacle which they have to fight again. At this point, Britain's sitting there going, well, we ruined your maritime infrastructure after World War I, so let's see what comes. We're going to keep concentrating on Japan. You can see bulges added in later on. And uh, to an extent, Italy, but we'll worry about you when you actually build something. First round of things the Germans build Scharnhorst and Neisenau. They are something worth worrying about, but again, the Royal Navy is not too worried about them. Let's be honest, the modernized Renown and an unmodernized Hood can probably deal with Scharnhorst and Neisenau if you have any problems, and even unmodernized Repulse is not going to be exactly something they want to come up against one-on-one, -on -one, because whilst they might have nine 11-inch guns, six 15-inch guns are going to make a pretty mess of you. And as HMS Renown did show, admittedly there were orders from the mustachio gentleman at the top, a Hitler, in this scenario. Sometimes I'm talking about the uh, rather rotund fat gentleman, who runs Italy when I'm talking about Mustachio Gentleman on the top, but this one, it's, it's Hitler. Didn't like his ships getting sunk, so gave them orders that they had to not engage where they would risk getting sunk and severely damaged, which kind of hampers them, because theoretically, two fast battleships with 18, 11-inch guns between them should have won versus Renown if they'd actually been turning around to fight. And if possibly Renown hadn't been quite so furious over the fact that they'd sunk her destroyer. There wasn't a bit of an avenging mother hen scenario going on there. And let's be honest, there's got to be some things to figure out how she actually managed to score so many hits. Firing forward in fairly heavy seas, chasing them. That, that there, is, there is something going on there. But even saying that. Why are you building an aircraft carrier? You've got your surface raiders. Well, if you want to send out a large task group into the oceans and you want to be a bigger threat, you need to have reconnaissance capability. You need to have air defense capability because no one... I know there are people you can quote from. I know there are some admirals somewhere. Someone will dig up some admiral saying, aircraft mean nothing. But often those quotes are taken out of context. It's usually a line of something an animal going, at the moment, aircraft are not able of doing are capable of doing what this particular air proponent air power proponent has suggested they can. We don't know what they might be able to do in the future, but at the moment they can't, or it's an idiot. Um, you get them in every circle of life. Occasionally people are very, very good for about 20, 30 years of service, and then for some reason at some point, their brain just switches off and they're no longer any use for any to hide nor hen. Um, they're just not. So, this carries fighters. This carries torpedo bombers, as originally designed, and dive bombers. That will allow it to perform reconnaissance. Far better than float planes and seaplanes will do. Because remember, you have to stop to retrieve those. You launch a float plane from your Deutschland class or your Scharnhorst, and it's great. It can get out there and give you reconnaissance. And then it expects to be picked up. At minimum, you have to slow down and scoop it out of the ocean. I hope you get that right. 
at worst, you have to stop, deploy crane, slowly pick it up, and stay as stationary as you can in the ocean for a good few minutes while you're picking up. And then, of course, you've got to remember, you have got to build up speed again. And as Nisenau would tell you, that very lovely ship would tell you, if you're caught pretty much... She wasn't caught at full stop. She was caught going slowly by HMS Rodney. And she almost got caught by her and sunk because Rodney was going at full tilt. And if Nisenau had been just a little bit slower at spotting her, just a few minutes, either they, and building up speed, she could have been caught by 16-inch guns and wrecked. Despite being faster than Rodney, because the time it takes to build up to that speed. Because you have to not just be going as fast as Rodney to get away, you have to go faster than Rodney to get away. And if you start from slower and she's already going at full speed, it's the time taken to build up to that speed. So you definitely don't want to be stopped picking up aircraft. Not when you are pretty much a glass cannon, a.k.a. a surface raider from a nation which is blockaded in. You also have to remember that the Germans are not banking on succeeding in Norway. When they're designing their fleet, they have no idea they will succeed in Norway. They're not even planning to invade Norway at this point. That comes later when a very certain gentleman who's obsessed with building a new Norway goes and whispers in the mustachio gentleman's ear. Ugh. There are videos on this channel about that. Please go look at them. I'm not getting into him. Ugh. Anyway, leaving that to one side, they're also not expecting the fall of France. So if you think if your fleet is going to have to fight its way out into the North Atlantic, the odds are it's going to face airstrike along the way, and the odds are you're going to want to fight your way through things. A carrier is going to make that possible. Reconnaissance from a carrier, let's remember, there's no satellites, there's nothing like that in this period. A reconnaissance from a satellite uh, carrier can help you navigate around obstacles, both naval, which are moving, and non-naval. So a carrier is very, very useful. It's also a status symbol. Italy doesn't have carriers at this point. France is building two new carriers. Who has carriers? Britain, America, Japan, the big powerful countries. Remember, there is a naval treaty system, which has only recently started to break down because Japan's left it, which basically said the world ranked as Britain and America at the top, Japan in second place solo, France and Italy below that, and everyone else below them. Because they weren't, wor weren't worth including in the treaties. So think about that. Think about that from the ego of the people we're talking about's perspective. That's insulting. Germany once spent so much money on a fleet, they lost the naval race in 1913. But, you know, it happens. So, the Graf Zeppelin is a symptom of all these things. Of the plans for their task forces getting out into the ocean and what they can do when they get there. Of making it viable for them to get out there. Then they also realise their fleet is not going to be ready for a long time. They realise the industry and the capabilities they have at their disposal. They realise the reality of the scenario they're in, and that explains a lot of what you're talking about in terms of their guns. Why are you wasting valuable tonnage, valuable ship space, Valuable electricity on 16 6 inch guns. Why? Well, if you're thinking you're not going to have any escorts. And that also tells you something else about aircraft carriers, and that was recognized in the 1930s. In, uh, as definitely recognized. So recognized that. 
even Nazi Germany, which didn't operate aircraft carriers and didn't even have a full, a sort of fully capable, full spectrum navy at this point because of the effects of the uh, Treaty of Versailles, had picked up on. Carriers operate with escorts. You send them out to sea with escorts. And if you don't have escorts because you don't have the infrastructure to build those escorts, then you've got a problem. Now, in an ideal world, the Graf Spey would always be operating with a Scharnhorst, a Neisenau, a Bismarck, a Tirpitz. Would always have a Hipper with it. Would always have maybe a light cruiser, maybe some destroyers. But that's an ideal world where you can get the fuel and the supplies together to get that kind of task force out to sea. And you'd better hope those destroyers aren't the 1934. Because they're just... no. But this is the problem for Nazi Germany. This is what they're always facing. You can build an absolutely amazing carrier. Or you can build what will suit your situation and suit the realities of your situation. Or you can build an absolute mess which attempts to compromise being an amazing feat of engineering with all the most innovative and perfect engineering solutions and will fit your situation. And when you've got a committee system which will not compromise, where everyone has to get the best fit, the best solution for the problem they are dealing with or aspect they are dealing with of the design, you end up with the Graf Zeppelin. I always prefer that picture at the top. And I have to say, what always really annoys me about the Graf Zeppelin is the sheer damage the over-engineering does to what could have been a very interesting design. And also the fact that, honestly, if the Germans had built an aircraft carrier and there had been carrier engagements in the North Sea, North Atlantic, then... How do I put this politely? Then I might not spend half my time having to argue about whether or not the Royal Navy were full, was full of battleship admirals, because those people tend to forget conveniently all the things which carriers were used for by the Royal Navy in the North Atlantic and in the Pacific, in the Mediterranean and even in the Pacific because they didn't actually get into a carrier on carrier fight. As close as Operation Sea came, the operation into, uh, uh, into the Indian Ocean by the Japanese, they didn't actually get into a carrier on carrier fight because the German carrier never gets finished because the Germans can never finish the work on the constantly changing and moving goalposts of building the perfect engineering feat of an aircraft carrier, especially when you have, well, frankly, the drain that is the German army. And you always are going to have the drain that is the German army. And also the mustachioed gentleman. Who has all sorts of fun ideas and the entire construction program? Let's be honest. If your own admiralty, your own naval cons command constructors are working against you by misreading your your designs, and you can't go back and go, you misread this, you've done this wrong, you're in trouble. And so we don't get that. Do I think the Graf Zeppelin, if it had been completed in either it's 1939 or 
1942 organization. Do I think it would have been? Excuse me a second. I've just noticed I've mislabeled something. Sorry, I just realized that the version I had up there of the aircraft carried had one of my, one, uh, had the original version, not a version which I had adapted with adding, trying to add in even more. I'd worried this one would look a bit fussy compared to the other one, but this one has far more detail because what it has is the 1930 air group proposal when they're first looking at aircraft, aircraft before they bring in Oh, what was the name? William, uh, Wilhelm Hadler, the uh, naval architect. And then by 1939, the air group proposal is 1934 onwards. There's until about most of 1939. There's 12 fighters and 30 dive bomber ish types. And then 1939, they add in torpedo bombers. Because someone suddenly notices, well, hang on, what happens if we want to hit sink something heavier? Something we have to let water in, rather than air in and hopefully start a fire. Something we actually... And then, of course, by the time you get back to, get to 1942, you've got a very interesting air group proposed, where you've got 28 dual-roll aircraft, which can either do dive bombing or torpedo, be used as torpedo bombers. The point is, as it's going through, the actual air group does illustrate these changes of roles and the changes of roles in the aircraft carrier from first of all being this air cover vessel to get the task groups out to the Atlantic and the reconnaissance to being a strike asset that's going to help with getting uh, rid of threats to your getting out to the Atlantic, i.e. things like cruises, etc., which could be providing counter-reconnaissance and manning something like a, well... The German Navy was thinking about a North Sea Patrol, but of course, eventually it's be the GIUK Gap. And then, later on, it's, hang on, capital ships, let's try and slow down those capital ships. That's where the torpedo bombers come in. That's also part of the trouble. Bear with me here for the Germans, and this is especially true of the German Navy, but other smaller navies in World War II tend to suffer from this as well. They are trying to cram so much into the very few hulls their infrastructure can produce. You see this in the Amata class. You see this in... The Italians are quite good at avoiding it, but y y you see this in the Dutch hesitancy whenever it comes. They're, they're always just about to order their major units before war breaks out. Always just about. Because they fuss around because they want to get these things right. And they overthink. And you can see this happening today in the smaller navies that the world now has, because navies have got less and less of a share of the pot of funding, but also there's less and less of a pot of funding to go around, as there's usually funding on other things. The governments have to do cover other things. Their populations require other things. Which is, yeah, that's, that's part of the modern world. But if you're building fewer of something, it's even more important you get that thing right. And therefore, you're going to think about it even longer. You're going to go through more and more iterations. There are more and more points where more people can interfere with it. Because if, if you review it for four years, okay, you've only got to deal with those people in who are in those relevant positions over that four years. If you're looking at something over the period of a decade, that's infinitely larger. Infinitely more potential cooks wanting to add their own special sauce to the well, their own ingredients to the special sauce, or their own version of a special sauce to the plate. Oh, 
And that's ultimately the Grass Zeppelin. I know this probably sounded repetitive on that point, and I know I've probably laboured it a little bit on the heavy side. But I want people to understand that's where my criticism of her comes from. It's that, realistically, if you're going to attempt something with this level of complexity, it's not gonna, it shouldn't be your first generation carrier. It shouldn't even probably be your second generation carrier. It should be your third generation carrier. And I don't think, honestly, you would build this system for your third generation carrier. Because once you start operating aircraft at sea, and you start realizing the realities of dealing with the controlled crashes that are aircraft landings. And the violence that is the acceleration of a takeoff. Especially in, on a vessel where these things are not stable as they are on land when they test them on land, but on sea when the ship is moving. you are going to seriously reevaluate some of your ideas. So therefore, ultimately, in all of this, the Grass Zeppelin is probably captures more attention than many others of the ships which could have been because she is actually built. But also because people look at all these engineering ideas and think, this must be going to be a great ship, because look at all these things they're doing, which no one else is doing. So it must be really cool, because, you know, the Germans like to innovate and produce these extreme engineering facilities, and... Yeah, no, this doesn't work on this occasion. In fact, it doesn't work on a lot of occasions. Because, as a rule, the Germans over-engineer it because they spend so much time thinking about it. Because they can't produce that much. Because there are such limitations on their industry. Because of the way they have been specifically left from the Treaty of Versailles. And no amount of secret programs, which are low unit volume, for sort of almost cottage industry productions, are going to make up for that. It just isn't. People ask me sometimes when World War Two was won. I usually say 1918. The fact it had to be fought is a terrible waste of life. But it was won and decided in 1918 with the Treaty of Versailles. And yes, perhaps if Germany had been lucky and there hadn't been the Great Recession and their government had managed to consistently have governments investing in infrastructure, investing in rebuilding all the things lost and building up alternatives to give them the other op to give them options to work around what they've lost, then maybe things could have changed. But it didn't. It had governments which lurched, lurched from crisis to crisis, which lurched, lurched from shiny to shiny. Whether it's the Weimar Republic or Nazi Germany, both are equally as at fault for that one. There are some good, good politicians in the Weimar Republic in its early days. It has some good ones to begin with. It doesn't have many by the end. Most of, them, most of the good ones died out early on. And the Graf Zeppelin? Well, you have lots of wonderful engineers, lots of brilliant scientists spending years working on systems for this ship. Some of those systems, frankly, should never have been wasted any money on if anyone had done a cursory thought of consideration of 
Why are all the big navies not doing this? Why is Japan, which we've gone to look around, not caught doing this system? Why are Japan and America, who are building these huge strike carriers, not doing this system? Why is Britain, which is building aircraft carriers to operate on the other side of the world from their industrial base, who are building carriers to operate in every single ocean of the world, with that in mind to protect their global spanning trade and empire, why are they not doing this? No. That's all for we're Germany. We know better. Arrogance coupled with limited infrastructure is a heady brew. But it tends to fall flat. Thankfully. So that's the Graf Zeppelin. And that's how she ends her days. Evaluated by the Soviet Union and even they go, Oh my lord, we don't know much about aircraft carriers but this thing. <laughs> no way. And, by the way, the Soviet Union had originally planned on building a copy of the Graf Zeppelin, so... If after World War Two they're going, <clears throat> no way. Uh, something they they they've the world has changed and moved on, and they've realised no. And even for them, it's sort of the fact the fact that the Italians were going to use the same system as the Graf Zeppelin was going to use. The Soviets were going to copy it. Of course, we've got Fock on. Uh, we've got. Is it, is it Fock? No, is it? We is it Fock? Uh, the next generation French carriers were going to be using their own French system. So you would have had f four of the world's navies, theoretically, if peace had continued, using variations on this system. Which would have been highly intriguing. Highly intriguing. But, uh... I don't think ultimately... The Royal Navy, US Navy, or Japanese Navy would have switched over. And I have a feeling, as amazing as those systems would be on paper, in the practicalities and realities of war, I can see them letting their ships, that are those ships and crews down. And I can see them getting severely mauled by the more rugged systems employed on British and American carriers. Now, at this point, I should probably talk about Shipshape.org and our fundraising for a trip to Australia, but I'm not going to add that into this video. It's already gone far, far longer than the 20 minutes I'm supposed to be doing for these net key ship videos. So I'm going to apologize for that. What have we got coming up? Well, on the 4th of May, we have the Battle of Hakodote, which I hope you're going to enjoy. This is going out on the 1st of May, and there'll be another key ship on the 3rd of May. These are coming out instead of the usual uh, videos from Twitch streams, because, well... I'm not at home on Friday and Sunday evening uh, the last couple of days to be able to do a Twitch stream. And as this comes out, I'll be hopefully well on my way home from three days being a course director and running an A-level and GCC revision centre. So, I hope you've enjoyed it. What have we got coming up this week? 2nd of May, May fly to present day, naval aviation. Ooh, I think I'm recording that at some point this week before I go away. Take care, have fun, and enjoy. And I normally end these videos with a question, so I am going to end this one with a question. What do you think would have happened if... Nazi Germany had built a simpler carrier design. A, how do you think they might have simplified it? And B, if they had simplified it and completed it, what do you think would have happened? I'd love to hear your thoughts, because I do think you would need to have a, to have it completed in time, and 
People always just look at the slipways and go, it's the number of slipways which are a problem. They are. They are a constriction. But you also need fitting out docks and yards with the people trained to do the fitting out of and the finishing of a ship. Because, again, the Graf Zeppelin, she launches in December 1938. She launches... About, well, she launches on the 8th of December, I think. And Illustrious launches on the 5th of... I think it's the 5th of April? Yeah, 5th of April, 1939. So, almost very, very close to five months earlier. And yet... Illustrious is commissioned May 1940. Theoretically, considering she's launched before war begins, you should be uh, well before war begins, and I'm talking about over uh, nearly nine months before war begins, and Illustrious is commissioned during wartime, uh, you should probably be able to walk back Illustrious's commissioning from that. So let's say, let's take off five months from May. And you could get a commissioned in December 1939. Maybe January 1940. She should have been commissioned. And just think of the effect that would have had on World War II if the Graf Zeppelin, or a version of her, had been commissioned in January 1940. That's going to be a big impact, because that means she's available for Norway. Theoretically, it could be worked up in the ba in the bar in the sort of Baltic. It's worthwhile thinking about. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed.